Um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, your excellencies, uh, and uh, our hosts in Fujera. Thank you for having us, um, and welcome to the leadership roundtable session on energy security, which I think we've heard probably mentioned a few times today, and um, uh, inevitably it has migrated to the top of many different agendas, uh, particularly in the context of the current uh, few months that we're passing through, whether it be uh, the Ukraine situation uh, and the passage of energy between Russia and Europe, or whether it be in northern Iraq, Syria, where uh, a number of oil fields and production facilities have been taken into the hands of uh, an insurgency, or may, by the way, in the context of this discussion, demand erosion and demand security, not just supply security, but China. China down to 7% uh, in the last quarter. Obviously, one would all agree, I think, that China demand has been the engine that propelled oil prices from 20 whatever dollars a barrel to $100 a barrel, China and the Asian demand story. So we've got two issues on both sides to discuss here today, uh, supply, security and demand security. Suppliers want demand security uh, uh, in order to expand capacity and, 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 and consumers want uh, supply security. And so there is the, the essence of our conversation. Uh, I'm honored to, to have join us today uh, a distinguished group uh, of, of, of speakers and I'd like to introduce from my left uh, who has yet to join the conversation today, His Excellency uh, Nagiv Aliyev, which as we come from this part of the world, we have to pronounce multiple different names all the time and quite often get them wrong. I'm generally known as Seen Evers, but my name is Sean Evers. So if I've done thank, damage thank to your you name, so much, we, can, we, can, we can all <laughs> My relate. name is Mati Galiev, I am Minister of Azerbaijan. Yes. Minister you give us energy. the correct pronunciation. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Minister of Industry and Energy uh, of Azerbaijan. And as we know, uh, Baku uh, and, and Azerbaijan has a number of years ago, 10 years now, built an oil pipeline to uh, Baku to Sehan and are now looking to do something similar in gas. Uh, we're to his, his Excellency's left, we're joined by Dr. Fauzi Ben Sarsa, who's a senior energy advisor to Euro energy European Commission and interestingly enough, has just moved to the UAE. Uh, so the senior energy advisor to the European Commission no longer lives in Brussels, he lives in Dubai. So that in itself could be the definition of energy security. Uh, to his left, we're joined by Dr. Ali Akbar Safai, the managing director and board member of the National Iranian Tanker Company. And for multiple reasons, it's wonderful to have the Iranian voice at this table, uh, and perhaps having two. Uh, uh, we've already been introduced to His Excellency uh, Adeli of the Gas Exporting Countries Forum. And we're also joined uh, for the first time this morning by Saeed Khoury, <laughs> the CEO of ENOC uh, and a member of the Dubai Petroleum uh, Council, the Supreme Petroleum Council. And uh, in the context of Dubai, Dubai has uh, great concerns for energy security. As a resident of, of Dubai, it's certainly something I think that's at the forefront of even down to a, uh, a residential level. Um, so that is our, 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 our plan, that's our program, and I would like to start with uh, Dr. Fauzi, uh, giving us a, a sense of where European energy security is. Uh, what we heard a lot this morning, uh, it was actually Adeli saying that there's no way you can divorce from Russia, you're locked in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a permanent marriage, uh, and all of this, verbal that we're hearing out of Brussels and elsewhere in Europe is simply decoration. What's your thoughts? What is the diversification of energy security in the EU? Well, thank <coughs> you very much, uh, Sean. Uh, good morning, my dear colleagues, for time. I mean, the, 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 if, you, if you allow me, I will not be a diplomat because I think that this is what Sean would like and yep. uh, want, want we us to We left diplomacy say the at the door. 
The cameras are just there for purely decoration. Purely decoration. <laughs> so the, 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 the issue of energy is becoming, uh, has been, and is becoming on the top of the political agenda, uh, as we have seen. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very interesting to notice uh, fundamental things. I mean, the EU, this animal of 500 million consumers, which is the, the biggest integrated market in the world, where you can have energy from uh, Portugal to Finland, this animal is surrounded by the biggest conflicts in the world. And this animal is surrounded by the biggest resources in the world. Geography is here. You take it from Russia to the Caspian, to Azerbaijan, to Central Asia, to the Middle East, to North Africa. You are going to find 90% of the resources. So this is a fact. Uh, there is something in terms of energy, and I, I endorse what Mr. Uh, my colleague and friend Mr. Ardini said this morning uh, about the overall challenge, uh, except maybe just to clarify that, uh, that uh, the EU has a very clear, very, very clear policy, strategy, and vision on its own policy in the future. Uh, what would the top of that list be? What is no, the, the number one? The, the, the number one, the, the, the EU has made it three, three directions. And three, the that's the EU, it's never one. <laughs> It'll uh, always be multiple. Always multiple. It's affordability, sustainability, and security of supply. Those are the three points. Your question, Sean, is very clear this morning. Are we going to divorce with Ukraine? Are we going to divorce with Russia? I mean, this is a nonsense. This is a nonsense because geography is there and you are not going to change geography. Russia is the biggest energy in the world, <laughs> being it in oil, in gas, in uranium, in nuclear. We have real lessons in the gas sector since more than 30 years. Okay. Ukraine, it's not coming from today. We had the gas crisis in 2006. 2007, we had the gas crisis with Belarus in 2008. We have a gas crisis, a tremendous gas crisis in 2009. And today, what's happening in Europe, in Ukraine, I would say is a consequence of a political problem. And it's not an energy problem. Well, clearly it's a political problem. I don't think so, there's any doubt so about we have that. To put but it, it is an energy problem in the context that, that it is one single route and that is an energy problem as compared to a any country would want to diversify, regardless of the politics, away from a single source. There is a very serious gas problem. I mean, Ukraine, Russia is supplying more than 40% of the European Union gas on the top of Norway and Algeria. Uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine is transiting something like 140 billion cubic meters. It has the biggest storage capacities in the world. Uh, and what people doesn't know is that the EU is host hostage of a conflict between two external partners. There are no commercial relations between EU and Ukraine. There are commercial relations between Ukraine and Russia. There are commercial relations between EU and Russia. It means that this conflict for which we are used since a couple of years needs additional political, technical, I'm not going to financial uh, effort to make sure. So I can tell you Sean, that there is a trilateral dialogue going on between uh, Brussels, member states, uh, Kiev, Moscow, on how to handle the restructuring of the gas relations on the east. We are 20th of September. Everybody knows that the winter season has already started. Everybody knows it. Everybody knows that certain people are already freezing. What I can tell you is that in terms of EU Although we are not directly involved, we have a full, uh, a full diplomatic and technical actions going on. Let me just bring in His Excellency from Azerbaijan, 
as a, as a supplier, uh, as a, a, a exporter of energy, is the Ukraine situation a kind of blessing in disguise for you uh, in the sense that it triggers a greater urgency to diversify and so possibly make a gas pipeline out of Azerbaijan to Europe economically viable and, and where otherwise it may be a question mark? Is this, is this a, a good thing for you? Thank you so much for the question, but before I would like to say hello, good morning, all our colleagues who are here, and uh, would like uh, to say that energy security, you know, it is a very important now issue in the agenda of all politics in countries. Uh, half of the world are concerned about the uh, you know, events, what happened in Ukraine, Russia, and uh, how will be future relations between two countries. But uh, I think that it imp uh, had very big impact, not only on geopolitical situation, but on the energy map of our region. Uh, you know, in the energy the, map of our region being Central a region, Asia? Uh, a region, Europe, it is Caspian region, it is Russia as well. Uh, that as well, you know, we uh, see uh, the, that your uh, energy map is changing. We, now we see new players, you know, we see new uh, situations. Uh, which, uh, uh, you know, gives us opportunity again to see what be our energy politics. What do you, you think is the, is the biggest challenge to you and to your vision for a gas pipeline to Europe? What do you, is it, is it has to cross too many borders? Uh, you don't have enough indigenous domestic supply? What is the biggest challenge to that? I, I don't think uh, if you mean Azerbaijan, we yeah. have no see uh, uh, any any challenges because our projects, it uh, they were before, you know, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, we are, uh, uh, had uh, negotiations about a new corridor for Europe, and it is the Caspian region, and uh, if you know Caspian region, the only. Uh, a real country who has now the resources, production, natural gas, who uh, is now the real exporter of gas, it is Azerbaijan. And now we, uh, you know, have all the infrastructure to deliver oil, oil products, gas, electricity to our neighbor, neighboring countries and to Europe. Would and you and, and would we you are working now, and we are working now on a very big project with EU, with our uh, countries like Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, Greece, Italy, on the implementing the very new project. This is Southern Gas Corridor, which delivered the 16 billion cubic meters additional gas to Europe. Uh, since uh, 2019. Would you expect Russia yeah. to try and obstruct that corridor? Never. You know, we uh, never uh, have uh, some pressure or, uh, you know, obstacles uh, which will be created uh, by Russia because, you know, it is, uh, uh, we cannot uh, compare our reserves or our production with the such huge amounts which were uh, exported, uh, exported by Russia oh, and reserves. Would you, would that you, is why. It, it is no competitive. But would you, would, if the southern no corridor could see, and do you envisage, Iraqi gas or eastern Mediterranean gas out of uh, maybe Lebanon, Cyprus, even Turkey offshore, that could plug into this corridor yes. and it become a significant... Uh, the collection of yeah. these players. Is that part of the vision for that project? Yeah, we hope so. You know, we uh, really believe that uh, in future, Iranian gas, Iraqi gas, Kiefer, like you mentioned, or Israel, and so on, they have discovered, you know, 
we have amount, uh, big amount of uh, reserves of natural gas, and they, they will be, it will be available for European market. That is why when we uh, projected uh, our this gas corridor, uh, you can imagine that uh, we uh, are hope that in nearest future uh, maybe we deliver uh, uh, natural gas in volumes of Azeri gas 25 BCM, you know. But we de uh, design uh, this uh, project up to 50, 60 billion cubic meters. Why? Because we very believe that sometimes Turkmenian gas will be uh, joined to this project. Like you say, Iranian gas, Iraqi gas, Kipper, Israel. I didn't it say is, Iranian, it is, but... It is, it is good. It is good corridor. It is a good it corridor. Maybe yeah, we can bring in Iran. Yeah. Do you th is that a is that a corridor that Iran could envisage exporting into? I know you're on the shipping side, but yeah. First of all, I would like to thank the Gulf Intelligence for inviting me in this forum. I'm looking at this issue from a ship owner point of view. So when there is a connection of the pipeline, we can see a decrease amount of demand for shipping sectors to carry the cargo. As His Excellency, the minister explained about the issue, the amount of gas which is exporting from Russia to European countries is huge. And well, as you envisage the capacity building exercise, uh, Iran is building a, de a deep sea port on the Indian Ocean for the first time, uh, obviously investing a lot of money uh, with capacity for export there, perhaps in time LNG export. How do you ba balance that investment versus the idea of pipeline uh, export through the Caspian and up through to Europe? Actually, to go in, in that question, I can, and can say that uh, always there is a controversial issue debating on the advantage of the shipping versus the pipeline. Actually, to come to that respect, I can explain about it that if the strategy if, is to go for the LNG export, I mean, which is a huge amount of LNG resources we have in our country. There has to be always a triple contract between the exporter side, importer side, and, and, and pipeline or shipping side. I mean, the, the way in which we can transport the, the gas from origin to destination. In that respect, we have experienced some negotiation and some contract between some countries in previous years to export, uh, invest at first for LNG production side, and then to export LNG from Iran to other countries. So in that respect, if you look at the shipping sector, the shipping sector can play a, a vital role to export those cargo from origin to destination. Since- How important in the context of Iran, if Iran is to emerge in the coming period as a, an, an, a significant gas exporter, do you, do you, is demand, how important is demand security to that vision? Would you anticipate participating in, in, in a spot, developing of, a, of, of spot cargo sales, or will you be looking for the traditional 25-year relationships? I think it depends on different kind of cargo. To my understanding, if you are talking about the LNG, yeah. there has to be a long-term contract in that part. For the LP, LPG, uh, still we have two kinds of two, two, two term, the long-term contract for exporting LPG, and also there is some room for a spot markets. We have the vessel in the market coming to the spot market, and for a, for example, a, for a single voyage they can do, or the consecutive voyage they can do. And also, we can have a long-term contract for the LPG export. It's two kind of two kind of project can be can be seen in LPG, but for LNG, most of the project is for the long-term contract. 
Can I just bring in everybody into the conversation before introducing our other two guests to have our, our first survey question uh, on this um, subject. Uh, if we could just bring that. You'll find on your seats a, uh, a voting <coughs> tablet uh, for, and essentially the first question is looking at um, very simply the, the what, what is going to be the bigger player, uh, and it's inevitably always a balance of the two, but energy security has emerged as one of the top agenda items for most political leaders across the world, producers and consumers. Which is a bigger threat to the balance of global oil markets over the next year or two? Supply security or demand security? Supply security, the troubles in Iraq, the troubles out of the Russia, demand security, the China erosion of demand. We've seen Saudi Arabian exports to, uh, to the United States uh, decline significantly in the last uh, few months due to the shale development in America. So which is the bigger threat to the balance of global oil markets over the next year or two? A or B, 10 seconds, please. It's a short-term outlook, but uh, one that is somewhat immediate with our thoughts. Oof, okay. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> neck to neck. Both of, both of them. <laughs> neck to neck, yes. Both. It's a neck so, to neck. Uh, exactly. That, that's the, nearly like the Scottish election results, <laughs> uh, which is, is interesting. I, I, I want to introduce uh, Saeed uh, of Dubai, um, a, a, a city and an emirate in which demand security or energy security is a vital issue. And the UAE and Dubai are doing a lot of fairly significant steps in order to tackle that. Can you maybe just outline uh, some of your plans? Yes. First of all, thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, Gulf Energy for setting up this uh, conference and uh, Pleasure. forum. I think it, it addresses a very uh, on-time subject of the, of the matter, where you can see a lot of insecurities around the region, definitely. And all these political insecurities have a direct impact on the energy supply. Dubai, as you know, is uh, as, as a city, even though it's a uh, part of UAE where it's exporting a lot of oil, but Dubai as a city does not have that much of uh, energy sufficiencies, and they're always uh, short of uh, energy sources. And it has transformed itself to be a very dynamic and uh, proactive uh, city to really secure that, that, that uh, demand in order to feed their stock, their, their, their growth. And as such, you see, Dubai was the first city who has started putting LNG import facilities to secure that, a few years and, back. And, and will that, that be a permanent facility, or will it remain a temporary facility? Well, it was called temporary, but I think there is nothing stops uh, taking that uh, option away from Dubai, because there is no alternative so far seen. So I would say it is going to be a permanent requirement of LNG to be, and as such, of course, Dubai has developed a very diverse uh, sources of energy. Today you see that uh, they have moved into also uh, solar uh, energy that's coming, it started, and then it's going to go uh, to a certain percentage of the, the Dubai energy mix to be solar. Definitely the LNG role is going to be more so they have uh, noticed that there is going to be the, the existing facilities could be replaced with bigger facilities to secure more. Would you envisage uh, a, a support of the LNG uh, regasification plant in Fujairah and that being a supply into Dubai or would you envisage Dubai having its own? Well, Dubai it has its own, but whether that is enough or not, of course, the uh, Fujairah LNG facilities will add a lot of value also, not only to Dubai, but to the whole UAE. So that will be definitely an important uh, energy mix and uh, energy addition to UAE requirement. As you know, recently also, Dubai has, uh, is in the verge of uh, floating a tender for uh, coal energy. 
which is going to be also in the length of about 3,000 3, uh, uh, megawatts, uh, addition to the energy requirement of Dubai. 3,000 megawatts. In two stages. The first stage, the first tender is going to go 1.2 million, uh, million megawatts. I mean, 1.2 1, 1. million megawatts. When will the final decision on green lighting that project go ahead? Well, I think it's, it's already started because they have finished the pre-qualification of the bidders and I, very soon they are going to issue the tender for the bidders to go toward that. Uh, that is something again. So that's a, that's a done deal. It's it going is to a happen. Done deal. It is a done deal, definitely. It is going to be part of the energy mix of Dubai uh, for the future by 2030. There is going to be a certain percentage of uh, energy coming from coal. So th this is where I think the, the mixture of energy strategy of Dubai is, is coming out. Of course, definitely, as you know, Abu Dhabi is building also nuclear power plants and part of that power plant could be coming also to Dubai. So looking at the how, how big a threat is uh, consumption for Dubai and the UAE's energy security if you don't get consumption under control? Well, we are trying to get consumption under control, and this is another, another issue that becomes a very uh, important issue, actually, not only for Dubai, but for the whole region. We have uh, managed to change a little bit the subsidy issue that is being done and which is going to affect, or is affecting a lot of the demand cycle in the region, actually, where recently we have, uh, for example, in, for power, today Dubai becomes a, a the most expensive maybe uh, power pricing in the region, in addition to the petrol, of course, but even though it's subsidized, but uh, the, the definitely the demand control of it is, has to be done with the, with the subsidy that is given. And I think even not only Dubai, but the region, if they can manage some sort of uh, uh, control on that uh, subsidy, definitely that will add a lot of value to to the demand. Can uh, you get to a sustainable position on energy security without controlling consumption? Personally, I think no. <coughs> I think uh, if you don't control the subsidy and the, the consumption, then definitely that is a, a, an open-ended demand. You have seen in the last few years, uh, the growth of the demand is tremendous, whether it's in fuel or in energy basically because of the subsidy. Today, people, for example, and sometimes uh, in Dubai, uh, a portion of the, of the population was taking water, for example, as free. So you could have seen that uh, people were just washing their cars and so on with hoses of water and a lot of waste has been done. As soon as the government has put some uh, fees on that water, uh, a lot of uh, control has been done to that. Uh, is there actually a deli to bring you into the conversation as the Secretary General of uh, the gas exporting countries? There, most of your members would have a heavy subsidy in and around uh, domestic fuel pricing. Mm -hmm. Is that a subject at all that features? Should it feature? What is the vision for uh, in the GECF for, the, for is there one tackling that and should there be one? Well, actually, this is one of the concerns of uh, most of the producing countries, uh, of gas producing countries, that the efficiency and uh, subsidies are the two most important uh, elements that you have to work on it. Some of the countries' uh, consumption would rise and without any kind of uh, reform in the subsidies, they would stop to be exporting anymore. I mean, we have uh, in uh, North Africa, we have Egypt, in our region, we have several of other countries. Uh, and there, there is conversation or that I've been in this morning where there's a desire to see some uh, standardization amongst regional countries on, on, uh, these, on pricing in order to uh, stop the arbitrage opportunity. Uh, could there be cooperation within GECF for that? Of course, uh, but I think that th there is no identical solution for different regions or different countries. I mean, uh, it depends because actually subsidy, although it's an economic uh, element, but uh, at the same time, it's a social, mm -hmm. it has a social impact. So it, uh, 
needs a careful study of the social impact of the subsidy re re reduction. I mean, uh, Iran has the experience of this with lots of turbulences until uh, reaching to the stable point, which one would say that maybe this is still not a stable point. So this is why, uh, uh, although it is good to have a collective uh, approach, but uh, it is good just to learn from each other experiences. You cannot find uh, a solution for Venezuela sure. and uh, another one for here or even in the different uh, countries here. Well, can we just uh, go to uh, Dr. Ali and, and maybe get some of your experience in the context of Iran uh, removed subsidies uh, uh, in the recent years? What, what have you learned? What would you recommend in terms of this uh, idea being adopted by other countries in the region? Actually, as Dr. rightly mentioned, it's the essence of subsidies is an economical issue. However, I can say also some, not only the social issue, but also in, to some extent, there is some political issues in to the subsidies, cutting the subsidies. So we have to be careful when we are talking about the removing all the subsidies. And, and, and the other point I would like to mention is the le level of the subsidies. In some countries, the level of the subsidies is too much comparing to, to international price of the oil or, or fuel. So when you want to move into the cutting the subsidies, there has to be a long-term plan for this activity. And so uh, what I can say is that depend on the culture also of uh, different countries, there has to be some plan to go in line with the culture of the people. Because when you used to, for what example- What do you mean culture? You mean expectation? No, no, I mean the culture of our consumption. Okay, habits. It had habits, yeah, yes. When, when for example, in, 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 in some area, we have the experience of cutting subsidies in Iran. In, in some region, for example, they are the, we have the poor people and the rich people. The amount of consumption in those, the rich family, is, is, is not comparable with the poor con people. Right. So when you want to cut the subsidies, you have to, to see also differently in, in, in different sure. parts you and can, families. You can do that. Yeah. From Europe's perspective, uh, where you're looking at the region as uh, diversifying away from uh, Russia or in addition to Russia, <coughs> yet this region is increasingly consuming more and more of its own energy. Uh, Africa, you know, one billion people today going to grow to four billion people over the next 60, 80 years, consuming more and more of their own energy. Does that, how does that concern you from an energy security point of view? Looking at a region here that is, its, it's trend line for consumption, Saudi Arabia is up to two and a half million barrels of oil a day and growing. Uh, how does that concern you when you strategize that this can be a region to support Europe's energy needs? You are right saying that, uh, that the region is of strategic importance for the EU and for the region itself. I'm uh, specifying for the region because our policy is to engage into dialogue with uh, Fujairah, with the Emirates, with the Gulf Cooperation Council. We have already an agreement with the Gulf Cooperation Council to uh, exchange cooperation and to exchange best practices and to exchange experience on uh, the questions, uh, Minister of, uh, of Subsidies, where we have a lot to say and to transfer on the question of technology, on the question of, uh, of energy efficiency. The head of states will adopt next week uh, an EU plan to cut, efficient, to cut the consumption by 30% by 2030, uh, and maybe one of the points which uh, we have agreed already this morning uh, is to work with uh, the region on developing the, the gas potential on the basis of a regional master plan. We believe that uh, the, the gas of the region has first to, set, to serve the populations of the region. We believe that the gas of the region has to serve first 
the electricity supplies to the region on the top of nuclear and other. Well, we uh, have UAE exporting LNG export. to Japan. Uh, and uh, we will be very happy tomorrow with Natik. Uh, we have a part strategic partnership since mm. uh, several years to work together on pipeline interconnections, yeah. being it through Turkey to the Balkans whatsoever. But I mean, we is, have your, is Europe, do you think, ready to put the, uh, not only the political muscle maybe that would require that southern corridor to emerge, but also the security muscle? Well, uh, Europe, Europe uh, you, you started this session by, uh, by, uh, by uh, saying clearly the issue of security. Uh, so I want to be into a long, long discussion on what is Ukraine, but uh, I can tell you that in terms of security, uh, the EU is, uh, is having uh, the overall caution on the top. Um, so, uh, but they're not, are not they're yet, they're not increasing their defense budgets in any way. Well, the, the, uh, Sean, let's, uh, I said we are not diplomats. The, the, what's happening on the East has an economic impact. Yes. Okay, it has, it has a, an economic impact uh, between Russia and Ukraine on the overall economy. However, it's recovering. However, it's, uh, we hope uh, for uh, very quick uh, solutions. Uh, and from there, uh, if you, you, you put the question of whether the taxpayer has to pay for security. Are they willing to pay a premium like the Asians are willing to pay? This is, this is the, the question which will be discussed. What I can tell you is that when it comes to the internal market, already the cross-border interconnections are to be considered in the future uh, into a very specific a new financial facility, which is called Interconnect, which will help for the external part. Discussions are going on how to help the diversification process on the top of what's happening already. Your Excellency, I'd like you to, to just think about the question of whether Europe should be paying Azerbaijan a premium for your gas. I'd be, just take the next survey question, if we would, up on the board. Um, in light of the Ukraine crisis, the EU is seeking to diversify its gas sources away from Russia to enhance energy security. Who will be the EU's biggest supplier of natural gas in 2020? Uh, all the usual suspects. Please uh, pick up your, your, your uh, clicker and uh, give us a vote for 10 seconds. US, Russia, MENA, Azerbaijan and Central Asia shale gas from within the EU, right under Birmingham. Uh, so, MENA, Russia, US. Will the US become the main supplier? Oh, I better vote. Oh my gosh. Yeah, <laughs> Pretty, that's true. The status quo, <laughs> who will be the EU's biggest supplier of natural gas in 2020? So the infrastructure is there inevitably. 2020 is only around the corner. But if we had said 2030, would that have made the vote any difference in terms of uh, Azerbaijan's outlook? Would you expect and should Europe expect and be ready to pay a premium for the security of supply in the way that the Asians do? You know, again, I would like to say that <clears throat> this is the most players. Uh, in, in the European market, and I think uh, that Azerbaijan or Cent in Central Asia will be uh, very useful uh, for Europe. And uh, I mean, twenty-seven percent is a big number. I, I would, I, yes, I think I, so. I, you should yeah. be encouraged. Yes, <laughs> you should every, start every, every, that <laughs> Thank you, colleagues. You believe in Azerbaijan in Central Asia, Absolutely. and I think so that uh, in. Maybe in 2020, uh, we will uh, play very important role, but not so big role, you know, in the... 220 uh, is a bit early, supply. perhaps. But uh, I think that in 2030, or maybe beyond, you know, it will uh, be Azerbaijan and Central Asia, and not only uh, Azerbaijan Asia, because we mentioned that it is Iran, Iraqi, Iraqi gas, it is uh, gas uh, from maybe in our regions, they make the, uh, you know, the most share uh, 
on the energy security of Europe. That is why we just uh, will uh, just wait how the uh, geopolitics will change. Uh, what, uh, like we said, how we, this region, who now uh, in our region is very perspective, how they develop their uh, resources. But it is depend from, in our hand, it is depends from investment. Capital. How, how, how do you, uh, you know, continue to invest a lot of money Huge to money. discover, yes, right, to discover new fields, to develop the uh, gas uh, fields, how you uh, just uh, uh, develop uh, your infrastructure, because it depends, uh, you know, not only for uh, how, how much or you uh, produce, but how the, you, by the reliable, uh, you know, direction, you can to deliver natural gas to, to market. That is why it's a lot of, a lot of factors. Let's open the floor to anybody who would like to make a comment or a question. Uh, please put up your hand. There's microphones wandering. Uh, we have uh, in the front row here, please. Uh, and can we also bring up the next question in the survey, please? Thank you very much. Uh, my question actually is to Captain Ali. I have opportunity to meet him and uh, Majlis. And uh, I just want to know more about uh, the, the, their, their shipping fleet, your shipping fleet. Uh, as you know now, LNG, crude, the chemicals. Uh, what is the percentage that you're carrying compared to the, to the other uh, shipping line? Uh, this one question. And the second question also, uh, last year, uh, if you remember, we have very, very good interview with uh, Shaharistani. Yeah about the shale gas and uh, what he's mentioned that is uh, during that is uh, the, the, the problem that Iraq is having, Iran is going to supply some gas to uh, the country. To Iraq. To Iraq. So I don't know if there is any changes happening, changing the political situation now in the country and how much and when they're going to start. Thank you. Okay, the first question, what is the profile of your fleet and what will it be in five or ten years? Actually, for the needs of our country, we have expanded our fleet to a number which could support the export of oil from our country to other countries in the world, particularly in the Asia. The composition of the fleet we have diverse the composition of the fleet, not only in the oil, but also in the gas and in the filled up cargo, which is required for transportation. Uh, as everybody, I think, which are in this room involved in the gas and oil, in, or in general in, in energy sectors, you are aware of the freight rate of the shipping transportation has dramatically fallen comparing to, for example, 2008. Mm -hmm. In 2008, we have seen the market of daily time charter of a VLCC for $250,000 per day, but nowadays it has fallen to $15,000 per day. Yes. It's a little bit increasing, particularly from the starting year of 2014, it's going up little by little. So is this an indication that you're not going to invest in new fleet because the price is low? Actually, it well, depends. Just firstly, what is the fleet? Can we just get that question? What is your fleet at the moment? Do you have so some five ships, 17, three oil tankers? Three, what, what is it? <laughs> it's <laughs> actually. I just got to get an answer for his question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying. Sorry, yes. why I'm asking this question because I, 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 we want to know that as a GC country, we already signed Marble Convention. So we are very, very concerned about the old fleet. I don't, doesn't mean that, uh, because I don't know. Still they are uh, the, uh, coping with the old one. Is it introduced the double hull? This is the issues uh, we want to know. This is a concern, especially in Fujairah. That's yeah. why I'm asking, what is their fleet? Yeah. 
What, how, they are, how, how big is what they knew? Are they changed from, uh, the, from single help to double help? We don't know anything about it. Thank uh, you. I think it's a it's very good question. <laughs> 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 really, as far as the safety and environmental issue of shipping is concerned, Captain knows that we have two main conventions dealing with this issue, which is, which is Solas Convention and Marple Convention. The Marple Convention, which is specifically dealing with the environmental issue in connection also to all kind of ship operation, particularly for the tankers, we have five annex of the Marple, uh, starting from the oil spillage to the air of the emission of the sucks of and NOx of the the, 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 the the emission of the sucks and NOx coming from the fuel consumption or on the on the vessel. To my understanding, all the annexes and the main convention has been ratified not only by the government of Islamic Republic of Iran but also by the the parliament and it is entered into force from the IMO and it is implemented in our countries and enforced also in our countries. Okay. Therefore, to we have to be, excuse me, we have yeah. to be, Captain, comply with the regulations. If we don't comply with the regulation, we cannot do the international voyage. Even also, we have the concept of flag state control in our country, which inspect all the vessel. And the vessel, when the vessel is coming to other countries, we have the concept of port state control, which control the vessel in the view of the safety, security, and environmental issue. If, and, and if the vessel in one certification is not going to comply with the regulation, the vessel has to be out of service. So your fleet it's is very compliant clear. to international standards. Sure, sure. And, and the, the second question vis-a-vis -vis export of gas from Iran to Iraq, do you have any update on that? Do you expect that to one other point also I, I would like to mention in that question is, is, is very important, is that when, when a fleet you are operating, the age of the fleet is very crucial. Mm -hmm. And the concept of double hull tankers nowadays has come to the end. By the end of, by the end of 2014, we should not have any single hull tanker in the world to operate, N not only more than 500 GT, but also in my country, according to the uh, parliament approval, we cannot have also less than 500 GT single hull tankers operating in the internal, internal water or territorial waters. Okay. So Is there any other questions? Uh, yeah, one behind and one here in the front. So uh, <coughs> we'll just take this gentleman and then this gentleman, please. Yes, please go ahead. Okay, go for it. Yeah. If you just introduce yourself. Yeah, Faiz Majnou, member of LNG. I have one uh, question and one comment. Start Regarding with your comment and then do comments, your question. Comments, uh, subsidiary, you can say oil and gas. Gas is difficult because of the heating, weather condition in Iran, you can't put, uh, lift up prices during the winter because maybe... The You're talking, sorry, subsidy. 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 For sorry. oil, I think... Just hold the mic right For oil, when you compare subsidized $50, subsidized versus international market 100, 115, this is, can be control, I think, for gasoline and diesel for driving. Regarding the, the question regarding... Well, before the you go to your question, Emirates LNG is going to import gas yes. into the UAE. Yes. At what price point and how will that impact the local price point for gas? Well, I think the, most of it will go to the utility, the power utility. The, but you will have to buy it at international at market international rate. At international market, uh, the prices maybe by 2018, we see a lot of uh, projects coming, shale gas, uh, shale LNG project, Australian project, Canadian project, East African. So would, would, you, would you expect to pay Asian prices for LNG? Maybe mixed oil index exposed because all the region exposed to oil, alternative diesel, and uh, will be maybe half, Henry half part, oil part. 
And you'll we, sell it to the, the utilities at? It's the government. The government, uh, right. It's yeah. government. So your question. The question, the impact of uh, Russia, China, LNG, uh, or pipeline gas project, how much will impact the future supply to Europe and the, for also the Chinese LNG import in the future? OK. Anybody in particular? No, it's not my <laughs> question. Mr. Erexi Adeli, the answer. impact of the Russia-China deal. Yeah. You know, the impact of the Russia-China deal for Russia would be minimal in terms of its exports to other places because this uh, gas is going to be extracted from the East Siberian reservoirs. It is not going to affect the reservoirs of, uh, in the West and the West Siberian which uh, is uh, intended for the European consumption. So uh, in terms of uh, Russia, there is going to be no, uh, 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 no major impact. But in terms of uh, China, China, of course, uh, the LNG import of China would be reduced. There is no question for that. And China would be importing, I mean, this uh, pipeline gas. So in terms of demand for, from, from China would be less. But of course, it would be compensated by the uh, current political uh, crisis that is going on as uh, it's called the uh, uh, smog crisis that is uh, forcing the Chinese to uh, consume more gas in, instead of coal. Plus they're still growing at 7%, so you would imagine yes. that demand yes. for yes. imported yes. gas will continue to grow. Yeah, continue to grow. But, uh, but still, I mean, if they are supplied with the pipeline gas, it would uh, uh, offset uh, the demand for the LNG. Right. Thank you. Um, please, you wanted to come in? You no. have a mic. It's no, just, just, just very simply to say that we are absolutely uh, not concerned by this issue. We do believe that the EU has a right to diversify and that Russia has a right to diversify. Yes. So we hope very much that the uh, Middle East gas will welcome to the EU to compensate. Sorry, there was a question in the front yes. row. You uh, thank you very much, yourself, and my please. compliments to the event and uh, speakers today. Uh, my name is Sharif. Uh, uh, you were talking, most of you were talking today about the supply and the demand and security. Uh, I don't know if my question is relevant or not, but uh, can, you, uh, can any of you please uh, elaborate on the legislation and the upcoming uh, demands on the green energy and other regulations, how much that could be effective and could be uh, importance to the pricing of the energy. I mean, the, the, the raising voice of having, you know, green energy, especially by 2000, 2020 so airlines using certain type of fuel. Maybe bring in, Saeed, in terms of the context of Dubai, the, the global reality is that governments have signed up to international treaties that limits carbon that would keep something in the region of 80% of known hydrocarbons in the ground. Uh, uh, some statistics of that nature, which are quite substantial. How will that guide UAE, Dubai's mix, nuclear, coal, LNG? Is there a parameter that you're limited by due to carbon commitments, or do you envisage being limited by carbon commitments? Well, as I said, uh, UAE always taking a proactive measures ahead of uh, the others. Part of their strategy is really uh, is due to environmental concerns. I mean, one of the major decisions for uh, whether it's uh, the uh, solar power is definitely has an um, for the impact of the environmental issues. Nuclear is the same. Today, of course, if you see at the initiatives that's been taken within the government of the UAE, a lot of this decision is really related or directed towards better controlling the environmental issues. Uh, recently, as you said, the uh, UAE cabinet has finalized the implementation of low sulfur uh, diesel. Again, this is something that uh, will have an impact on the environment with respect to emissions and so on. And I can see also that the trend will be going towards more of encouraging the diesel consumption in the fuel uh, mix, for example. Rather but yet than we rather remain uh, one uh, of the highest per capita carbon footprint in the world, of course. in the region. And 
perhaps we, that needs to come higher up the agenda. That said, Europe seems to be throwing all of its carbon commitments out the door to grab as much American coal as possible. Do, do you envisage that Europe will uh, be limited by carbon commitments or they will slide because energy security is, uh, or the absence of a premium, where is carbon going to play a role? Well, we, we, uh, I can, I can uh, without violating the secret, I can tell you a couple of things that will happen beginning of October, I hope, if the head of state accepts. Uh, we will be going for, uh, for uh, a target of 40% uh, reduction by 2030. Four zero. Four zero percent for greenhouse emissions. Uh, the EU will be going into legally binding target of 27% for renewable by 2030. The EU will, go, will be going for uh, a reduction of 30% of efficiency comparing to 1990 by 2030. Uh, in terms of security of supplies, we are conducting uh, stress tests with member states. Uh, and I can already tell you that 90% uh, of member states are full of gas in their storages, so I'm not expecting a big problem by the end of the year, except local. So no winter problem? I hope so. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we are, uh, we are uh, strengthening what we call in the EU reverse supplies. It means instead of having gas from Russia to the west, we are going to have it from the west to Ukraine. Uh, Can I just bring in the questioner of, do you, yes. do you, are you, do you expect or do you, uh, would you like to see greater compliance to the carbon commitments uh, that? Actually, yes, I'm, I'm, before me, I'm, I'm not much concerned. I mean, I'm generally concerned as a human being what's happening. But, uh, but as I an energy to, supplier, exactly. as a hydrocarbon I, producing country, uh, carbon, carbon commitments is a threat to supply security yeah, or demand security. Rather. Exactly, and I'm saying uh, some people will tend to go to use uh, more of a green energy, I mean, more of a, uh, developed uh, type, I mean, uh, we know that uh, the legislation of the airline using certain thing in Europe by two, uh, 2020, it will change certain percent and it will go high. That will leave a different type of oil or different uh, fuel in a cheaper quality, more available. I'm just saying what percentage the registration uh, has impact on the pricing beside the security, beside the stability of the market, as well as we have another competitor, which is, of course, we're talking about renewable resources, which is that always has been a I mean, not even a compliment, just a by side. But I feel the environmental impact and issue, how much can it be important to this? Well, I, I would be of the view personally that I think it's probably much greater than we're paying attention to that carbon commitments today, governments are legally bound to, if they comply, to uh, keep a lot of hydrocarbons in the ground. We have a question in the front here as, uh, and maybe one in the back to finish off. Can we roll to the next survey question? Because I would like to get it answered and we're starting to run out of time, please. I'm BM Bansal from Gulf Petrochem. My question is to Dr. Uh, Mahmoud. Uh, just now, an uh, uh, assumption has been given about this LNG import that uh, the price will be maybe something between Asian and uh, local price. Is it a practical uh, aspect that as long as the demand is available in Asia and high price is available to the seller, why should be able to give it at a lower price? Why it should be at a lower price? Well, the, the, you're talking about LNG imports LNG into, import. into the UAE at a discount So to what Asia. I'm saying is, the assumption being made is that probably LNG will be available in this region at lower price than the right. Asia. Right. So is it practical? Is it practical to expect that L Emirates LNG will pay a lower price than Korea? Or you mean at the, uh, at the micro level or you, you, you mean on the trade? No, long term level. Long term, yes. You know, of course, this, uh, energy, this region uh, is an energy abundant region and uh, it has gas. Of course, some countries are gas surplus countries and some countries are gas deficit countries. Uh, actually, the region has not yet come up with a collective uh, kind of arrangement in order to feed its own uh, needs. Uh, this is why there are discrepancies. I mean, we have uh, 
countries here in the region importing from, uh, from Trinidad and Tobago. We have countries here uh, uh, where exporting it to, to other places. So uh, until we uh, come up with some sort of collective arrangement for uh, feeding the regional uh, consumption, I think that the prices would be uh, more or less the same as the international prices. Well, we won't uh, have to wait very long. What price do you, you expect them to pay? Uh, in Asia, it is being around fourteen dollars. But here, what what price is 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 Emirates LNG going to have to pay uh, when it opens? Maybe around twelve. How much? <laughs> twelve. Twelve. L less than transportation. Less than transportation. Mm. Of course, the fourteen is uh, in the Far East. Less yeah, than transportation would be something that uh, would be equitable for okay, you. Okay. Question here, quick questions with quick answers. Yeah, I have a, a question for Dr. Adili. The IEA has termed the next decade as the golden age for uh, gas. Yes. Are you that confident that demand for uh, gas will be the fastest growing and what is the sh uh, your estimate for the share of gas, oil and coal in the decade to come? Ooh. I'm definitely uh, convinced that uh, gas is a rising star. And You're actually optimistic. The, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. I am definite on this because actually the growth rate of demand for gas is 2.5% every year. So this is the fastest one in terms of other alternative source of energy. So in the energy mix, now we have, as I said, 23% of gas, which is going to be uh, 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 something around 25 to 26%, while oil would drop from 31% to 27%. Mm -hmm. So this is going, going to be uh, from the oil, it's going to be uh, to gas. Uh, also coal is going to be uh, reduced for 1%, not, not much, because actually there are uh, tendency to go for, for coal. Renewable also would be increasing. So this is why in next decade, we, uh, in next couple of decades, we uh, expect that the gas would be 26%, oil 27 percent, uh, coal 30 percent, and the rest would be uh, among other renewables. Okay, we have one uh, final question here. Oh, one at the back. This, uh, I'm not sure who was first, but if the lady could also have a microphone so we can go to her. Nope. My question is for Dr. Adderley. What's the status on the Nabucco pipeline for European Union? Which pipeline? Nabucco pipeline. Nabucco, yes. Will it go through or it's a dead issue? Well, I guess that uh, Nabucco, of course, uh, was uh, a very uh, interesting pipeline, uh, which was uh, just abandoned. But nowadays, uh, there is lots of talks now to revive that, uh, not in the same route that it used to be, but with new partnership and with new. So there are, there are lots of talks about that Nabucco and uh, having some uh, feed from, uh, from Iran, from Azerbaijan, and the, and the Caspian Sea. Do you want to comment on that, Quasi? Just to compliment that uh, if you have additional gas, we will be very welcome to revive Nabucco. Yes, right. <laughs> so. The main problem is the resources. The last word at the back. I just wanted to ask a clarifying question. Could you we, introduce yourself? My name is Sofia Kalanzakos. I'm a professor at New York University, and I'm here in Abu Dhabi. Um, I just or Fajera. Yes. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, no, in Abu Dhabi. Yeah, yeah, NYU yeah, is in Abu Dhabi. Yeah, yeah. I know where I am. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Um, so my question is, we talk about the increase of coal usage in the European Union, but there is political uh, will to, as we saw, reduce the um, greenhouse gas emissions. How significant has been this coal increase that, I mean, it ha there have been imports of coal from the United States, but how much has this truly changed uh, em or impacted the um, emissions across the uh, European Union because we have been on target and we are getting more ambitious in Europe in reducing the emissions across the continent. Thank you. Anybody? Carbon emissions, coal imports into Europe? Uh, coal. Uh, there, is, there, there has been some, uh, some change in the energy mix. Uh, you know, you know there is a thing which I would like to clarify here. So, the, the, the energy sector in the EU is managed by the private companies. It's not managed by the EU. 
Uh, and this re reminds also that in the region here, we very welcome if the kind of reforms allowing the private sector to play its role. Uh, now, when it comes to the coal itself, uh, we are referring to the problems of the, the MTS market and the problem of the import of coal so that took place uh, since the problem between uh, Russia and Ukraine. Uh, the, the, the expectations that the head of states will be discussing next week is to revive the overall carbon print and to implement specific financial mechanisms for this subject, but please don't ask me to tell you more uh, now because uh, they have to decide first. Do you have a, a view on coal imports into Europe, what that outlook might be? Do you expect it to grow? Chris Fake, Vittel? Longer term, no. I, I mean, I, right now there's a huge pricing advantage to coal, which is being exploited, and also uh, a big effort to build gas inventories in Europe ahead of possible problems this winter. So that's probably the two key drivers short term. Longer term, I expect the uh, environmental concerns to prevail. Okay, wonderful. Can we just wrap up with sort of answering the survey questions? If we could just drill through them very fast. Ten seconds on this one. Take the no. clock, please. No. Viable to know it doesn't, Come but still you. close enough. Uh, next question, please. Japan and South Korea represent 50% of global LNG demand. Importers across Asia are increasingly vocal against the Asian premium charged in gas prices for security of supply. Would an Asian wide gas buyers club, including India, Japan, China, and South Korea, the world's big four importers, be a successful strategy to pursue? to counter the gas producers cartel. Our optimistic panelist isn't so optimistic <laughs> no. on this question, but perhaps everybody else is. 10 seconds, please. That's... Um, that's 51%, yes. Um, was that the last question? Or is there one more? Give us one more and then we'll call it a day. In light of Europe's energy security concerns, what will be the most prevalent source of power generation in the EU by 2025? The energy mix, 10 seconds, please. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's not gonna change in 10 years? Coal make a comeback? No? Oh. Oh. There we go. <laughs> gas, gas, gas. It's been a gassy kind of day. Um, yeah. It's time for lunch. I'd like to thank our panelists, His Excellency Natig Aliyev from Azerbaijan. Thank you. Fa Dr. Fauzi Ben Sarsa from the European Commission. Dr. Ali Akbar Al Safai from Iran. Thank you for coming across. You're welcome. Saeed Khoury, CEO of Enoch. Thank you for your participation. His Excellency. Adeli, thank you for your time, and thank you, the audience, thank for your you. participation. And we'll thank you. <laughs> for